So, Brian, the, uh, the long soft bursts, we've got those ones pretty much figured out. Well, yes, because we actually see the supernovae that uh, we think create the gamma ray bursts. We actually see those things emerge from the gamma ray bursts. Now, exactly why and how they put out their gamma rays, still a bit of a mystery. But to first order, we sort of know what's going on here. But the real unsolved mystery here is the, the short hard bursts. Yeah, so we seem to have a good story for the short hard bursts that neutron stars come together, or maybe a neutron star in a black hole, and when they come together, they release a lot of energy, and some fraction of that energy comes out as a short burst of uh, gamma rays. And in the meantime, we also expect this is the place where we're going to make elements like gold. And amazingly enough, we do see a little blip of maybe the radioactivity associated with that type of element production in one of the most recent bursts. So Brian, I mean, quite apart from their intrinsic interest and mystery, surely we could use these gamma ray bursts. I mean, if, they, if the uh, long soft ones are really so incredibly luminous and so bright, maybe we could see them out to enormous distances and then use their spectra to study the reionization of the universe, just like we talked about in the last lesson. Yeah, Paul, that's certainly one of, uh, one of the things I find really exciting about these objects. And so I've been part of a team that's been looking for these for the last, uh, oh, 10 years or so. The problem is they're very, very rare. Uh, but we are able to see them, and the current record holder is this object. We believe it's at a redshift of 9.4. So that really is as distant as any object. Uh, there's no confirmed galaxy or quasar at this distance. Uh, and the way we know it is that if you remember from our discussion of how light travels uh, in the early universe, uh, the ultraviolet light gets absorbed by gas when the universe uh, uh, was, you know, had neutral hydrogen in it. And so you don't expect to see any light blueward of the Lyman alpha line, which is at 1216 angstrom, or 121.6 nanometers. So here we've got infrared images. This is the J band, which is you know, 1.1 microns, 1.6 microns, um, going up to 2.6 microns. And we're seeing nothing at the shortest wavelengths. It only starts cropping up at about 1.6 microns. That's right. So you can just maybe just see a hint of it in this band. And we see it quite strongly here and here. So this, by going through and figuring out where that cutoff would be, it would essentially be right on the edge of this color in the infrared. And that turns out that extends up to about 1.4 microns. And that gives you a redshift of 9.4. So all you need to do is get a spectrum of it while it's bright, and then you can actually measure the, uh, whether the universe is neutral or ionized at that time. So did you get a spectrum of this one? Unfortunately, we didn't. It's very frustrating to me because these things are amazingly bright. This was bright enough to get a spectrum of if only we had had our collective act together uh, because it did fade within an hour or two. And so by the time we realized what it was going on, the Earth had moved, and it was in a place where we didn't have any 8-meter class telescopes to look at it. So the holy grail will be to get a spectrum of these things. The most distant object we have with a bona fide spectrum, I would say there's one at 6.3. There's also another one at 8.2, which has sort of a spectrum. Uh, but the, these things are so bright, if we do it right, we should not just be able to get a spectrum to tell you how distant it is we should be able to get one that's bright enough so that our spectra will allow us to identify what the chemistry of the universe is back at these great distances. So where to from here? Well, I think there's a few things we really need to figure out. So short hard bursts, those are the mergers of two things. We might be able to see in the very near future gravitational radiation from them. And that would tell us all about general relativity. It would tell us about how these things come together. And it would really nail that story down. The other thing I would like to understand is why are some gamma ray bursts bright? And why are some faint? We see these supernovae that look almost identical producing gamma ray bursts that are thousands of times brighter than other ones. We don't really understand that at all. Could it be just because some of them are pointing their beams straight at us and some are pointing elsewhere? No. It seems that you either, it's not as simple as we're in the line of the beam or we're not. It seems that some produce a lot less energy than others. 
And some of these things, it turn out, don't produce a supernovae, a, a supernova explosion at all. And we can explain that because sometimes the whole star will get swallowed up into a black hole over a few uh, hours or minutes. And so maybe we understand that within the model. But we still don't understand why some are faint and some are bright. That's a, just a, uh, you know, a fundamental thing that we don't yet understand. So lots of work still to do. But the most exciting thing, I think, to do is to use these things to probe the early universe. We can go out and we can find these brightest of objects. We can see them back at the dawning of time when the first objects in the universe were created. We've got the first glimpses, but we haven't done it very well yet. If we can go and observe these things with a great deal of precision, we can literally see how the first stars and galaxies in the universe were formed using these things as little beacons that shine through everything in the universe. And we haven't done it yet, but that is something we can do. We just have to get our act together. This is using one unsolved mystery of the universe to solve another one. Exactly.